Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Prep Life on this special edition of Breakout. We are talking about self-defense. So self-defense is really easy to say, harder to follow, and even harder to understand. What I mean is, if I asked you right now what your criteria for self-defense, which actually means taking another human being's life, if I asked you what your criteria is, you're likely to give me the legal jargon that you learned in CCW, your concealed carry course, something you heard, something you read. I would use all force necessary to protect my life and the lives of my family against somebody trying to hurt me, trying to take my life, and I would defend my life uh, and use that force necessary to do so, even if that means deadly force. Something along those lines. But what I often find in our personal security courses, in our self-defense training courses, uh, even this weekend in mobility when I taught the mobility experience, it is often different than we perceive. So if I said, what is your criteria? And you gave me a legal jargon answer. And I walked you through a narration of an event. I would see your true colors. I would see what activates you. What makes you more proactive, more decisive, more indecisive based on that narration. So over the weekend, I had an amazing course in the mobility experience. Our next one's in June. Please come out and do that with us. Um, this one, because of all the snow, we had all the hard skills blocks of instruction indoors at my Fieldcraft HU. 7,500 square foot, plenty of room to pull vehicles in. We did recovery, maintenance, um, all the things. One of the blocks is security. And it's certainly important in your overland mobility game. Because if you're remote, you're exploitable. You need to know how to defend your life and the lives of your family, especially in and around a vehicle. So before I put them through a block of instruction, teaching them about some characteristics of vehicles, where to be, where not to be, advantages and disadvantages, I walk them through a scenario. And the scenario is typically my typical template for the experience. But I selected all the students that had children. I got to know them over the course of the few days that we were together. We broke bread together. I heard about their children, their families. And so I knew these particular people were emotionally invested in their kids. So in this scenario, at an Airbnb, their kids had to sleep across the living room away from them just because of the design and setup of the house. And I know it's not ideal and most people wouldn't set it up that way, but I don't give them the option. In some, some cases in life, including renting an Airbnb, we just deal with what we got. So in this scenario, I said somebody came through the front door and you were on the other side of the, the living room where your children were. As you looked in the ambient light, you saw the outline of a large male figure. And at the point in which the students declared they were using deadly force, they didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to virtue signal that they were. They simply had to do an action. In this case, I had them sit down. Some courses, I have them draw a simunitions pistol, or if I'm on a live, uh, in a live course, I'll have them draw a live pistol and shoot a target, representing, you know, figuratively, figuratively if they're sitting down and actually if they're shooting a target, them using deadly force. But also that they're decisively making the decision to shoot the gun. And there's no take backs. We often forget that. We're not talking about self-defense as a doctrine. We're talking about real life engagements where you're taking human life to defend your own or that of your family. So as we navigate this and I say, there's a large shadowy figure. It's a male figure and you see it's a male figure, but it's not your husband because he, he was in the bed when you left. Or it's not your brother because he was in the bedroom next to you guys. Immediately, somebody sits down. Then I say, um, as you watch that male figure walk towards the hallway where your children are, somebody else sits down. And then you look at the shadow and you can see the outline of a gun. Somebody else sits down. And then they turn down the hallway where your children are. Somebody else sits down. And then they turn to open the door to the bedroom where your child is at, somebody else sits down. And then I have them track them across the living room and get behind them about to announce who they are and find the light. 
so they could positively identify the shadowy figure. And they see the figure with the firearm right above their child and another person sits down. You turn on the light and you identify it's a child. It's a 15-year-old child who's the neighbor of that house whose buddy was staying at the Airbnb the night prior and he was just returning his airsoft gun. And most people will be bummed out by that because they would say, that's not how I would have done it. And I often say, well, how about I just put the gun to the back of your head when you're in bed with your wife? Because that happens. I, I know several people who have been in those incidents before where people were in their homes when they were sleeping. One guy I just talked to in San Bernardino where he was shot multiple times, multiple times while he was sleeping in bed with his wife. Luckily, he survived. So you don't always dictate the situation, the scenario. And so what I say to everybody is, do you feel bad for killing a child? And I'm asking the question because I want to know what people think morally and ethically about their dilemma. Because not everything is cut and dry like the flat range where you see a paper or steel target. And that's the point of the conversation. Simply, we have to have one. So then I go back and I do an after action review and I say, why did you sit down? Some people's answers are, I didn't want to take the chance. Some people's answers are castle doctrine, stand your ground, the legal argument and debate. And then I say, that's fine. You could debate that. But does that make you feel better about killing a child? Because that potentially is what you have to live with. And there is no right answer. There never really is a right answer when we deal with these kind of things, because it's difficult circumstance with a lot of variables. I just interviewed Colleen Darby, the wife of Ben Darby, a Huntsville, Alabama police officer who was convicted of murder and sent to prison for 25 years. Why? He was doing his job because this isn't very clear cut. So based on the use of force policy in Alabama, as they train their law enforcement officers and most institutions across the country train, if you have a firearm in your hand, and a law enforcement officer, in any circumstances, no matter how it got to that point, if you have a firearm in your hand and you're given legal orders to drop the gun and you don't, use of force based on the policy as written, even in Huntsville, Alabama, is justified. Complete, clear-cut case of self-defense. I think the case law is Graham versus Connor. The Supreme Court, Graham versus Connor. But when you look at this circumstance, why would it even be in question? Well, there were other variables, including police officers that were there on the scene who said they were trying to mitigate the, the circumstances because he was going to give up, even though he had a firearm. Now, it was a flare gun, but that still had buckshot in it, which could certainly kill or seriously injure somebody. And he had it to his head because the idea was suicide by cop. He moved. He was killed after giving lawful orders. But the other officers that were in the room, including one female officer, said um, she was trying to mitigate the circumstances and he was going to give up. And I'm paraphrasing here, but you get the gist. So one officer came in, was doing what he was trained to do, reduce risk to the officers who were in there who were complacent, certainly, and winds up shooting and killing justifyingly and gets cleared by his department. Glitch gets cleared by the chief and an investigation, and then later a rogue district attorney during the exact same time of George Floyd decides to prosecute, gets a trial, very speedy trial, and he gets sent to prison for 25 years. So what are we supposed to do as uh, law enforcement officers, law-abiding citizens, when you're thinking about the protocol in your mind that makes sense to you for deadly force, and the circumstances as, as written in law back you, but based on politics, based on societal drama, you aren't given that benefit of the doubt. What I often tell people in self-defense is when you pull that trigger and you save your life, the challenges have just begun. The challenges and the difficult and the degree of that difficulty has just begun. I had one scenario during the mobility experience where a couple, husband and wife, were out overlanding. They broke down and they couldn't get out of their vehicles. 
and I, I made it so they couldn't get other vehicles because I wanted them stay, to stay put. And two people came up to them being the aggressors. And I had them, uh, when I was one of the aggressors, I went to pull the female out of the vehicle and the gun was pulled on me. I continued to pull on the woman in the vehicle and I was shot and killed. The reason or the justification, and, and this was very informal at the point, was nobody touches my wife. Now, that student later came to me and said, if it was a police officer that questioned him, he would have had a different answer. What you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, remember that. So was the shooting justified? Most of my students thought it wasn't. One of the law enforcement officers thought it was. That was in my class. And it depends on the trial by your peers, potentially. That's what it might end up being. So if I'm pulling you out of a vehicle, does Castle Doctrine apply? Depends on what state you're in. But what is the circumstances? One of the guys that I was with, Mike Hernandez, he was playing the aggressor, and he was digging through the back of the vehicle because he was trying to steal stuff. And I was telling them to get out of the vehicle, grab the wife to pull her out, because I wanted to steal the vehicle. I didn't want to escalate, but the gun was pulled, and I was shot and killed. Is it justified? Maybe most of you would say, yeah, certainly. Somebody touches my wife. Somebody tries to pull my wife out of the vehicle. It's justified. But depending on what state, what district attorney you have, your story and your understanding of the law, that will dictate your future, your destiny. So this is a little complicated, guys. It's not as easy as the legal jargon you recite and spill. It's why I like USCCA. It's why I like organizations like that that do these things where they talk about case law, they talk about examples, they give you references, points of contact for lawyers, and this isn't a commercial, I don't even work with them, but it's like, man, that makes sense to me because your problems have just begun. It's one of the reasons we run personal security, which is available now, you can go online. Uh, Kirsten is teaching one of those courses very soon. Uh, I often teach them. We have a bridge course um, that's available as well. That's on philcraftsurvival.com. And these conversations are important. It's why law enforcement officers that we have on our staff teach. When I teach personal security, I bring in Mike Guyman, a local law enforcement officer, to talk through all the legal details, including how you present yourself to the police officers who arrive on scene. Some people say, never talk to the cops. How do you think that's going to fare for you if you don't do that? Because perception is reality. They're doing their job, and you're like, I'm not going to talk to you. Okay, well, you're going in handcuffs versus, man, I was scared for my life. I thought I was going to die. And that's enough said. What are the details? You shouldn't reflect on the details because you just went through a sh- stressful circumstance where you were taking bits of information a little bit out of the t- at a time, and you shouldn't overestimate that. That is very much th- the idea. Law enforcement officers, some uh, states and institutes, don't allow their officers to be questioned for 24 to 48 hours because it's complicated. Your brain is very complicated in how it perceives different things. Don't say a word except I was in fear for my life and the lives of those I love, and then think about all the circumstances and try to make sense of it in your head and through a lawyer. I want to give you an update of what's going on. Um, Twitter has an audio feature now, unbeknownst to me. I just found this last night. That Twitter feature allows you to do audio podcasts with meetings, and I'm doing some of these when we're we're talking about self-defense, survival preparedness, and I'll actually have one tonight. I don't I don't know if you'll you'll beat me to it, but it's tonight at six thirty. Um, we have survival kits and coffee. Guys, I did a YouTube. Look, Instagram, I'm done with Instagram. I post every once in a while my story, every once in a while in a blue moon. That platform, because of Facebook, is suppressing everybody. They just deleted Sig's account. They just deleted uh, my buddy's accounts. They're suppressing everybody who has anything to do with guns, politics, anything, because they don't like free speech. And they outsource all of the moderation for that in foreign countries who certainly don't like free speech. I'm spending most of my time on YouTube and Twitter because they're all about free speech, although YouTube is suppressing slightly with gun stuff. Um, Some of it I haven't seen. Some of it I have. I know it's happening, but I hate it. But I'm finding alternate platforms. 
I did a survey on my YouTube, Mike Glover Actual, this, this YouTube channel, and said, what do you guys want to see? You said more survival, so we're bringing it to you. Survival Kits and Coffee for March in Aberdeen, North Carolina. Land Nav in March. There's already eight seats sold. It's, it's likely to be sold out. Um, 12 March in Aberdeen, North Carolina. If you want to learn about any type of survival, Kevin Estella, our survival expert, is in NC. He just got done teaching in, in, in the Pacific Northwest with Greg Anderson, and he'll certainly be in North Carolina on 12 March teaching Land Nav. Also, canning and jarring with Kate. Canning and jarring with Kate, who's our uh, plants expert, She'll be teaching intro to canning and jarring 18 March in Aberdeen, North Carolina. Sign up for those classes, guys. Those are amazing classes, like canning and jarring. I thought Phil Craft does tactical gunfire. That's, it. That's important. Self-defense is important. But so is sustaining your survivability over the long haul. And so that's important as well. June 30th through July 2nd, uh, Kevin Estella will be in Utah teaching survival, which I'm always looking forward to doing because um, he's our – He's our survival expert. I'm not a survival expert. I lean on him for that kind of advice. Also, I'll be in Texas this weekend teaching a leadership seminar with Jared Taylor from Black Rifle and Andy Sumpf. Make sure you come check us out. If not, um, I'll have more of those on the calendar very soon. I just set up a couple San Bernardino courses in May. I also set up for the first time in a long time, maybe, maybe years, one April, I set up a course on um, – uh, Pillars of Preparedness Seminar on 1 April in Phoenix, Arizona. Looking forward to that. Guys, I appreciate you. I, I, I appreciate all the things that you guys do for Phil Kraft Survival, for me, and supporting the channel. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification tab, all that good stuff. Till next time, peace out, guys.